Everybody good to go? Are we good to go? Yes. We're good to go. Good evening and welcome to our annual Socratic Dialogue. This is our case study senior capstone course that conducts this special event every year. And we're pleased to have you with us tonight. We're going to take a, a brief look. Our panelists are all sitting down here in the front row. We're going to take a brief look at a PowerPoint that's going to kind of set the stage for everything we're doing tonight. And then we'll come back and I'll introduce the panelists to you. So good evening and welcome. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shannon and I'll be explaining um, our topic tonight which is native advertising and how it's changing the rules of the road in PR and communications. Before I begin, I'd like to discuss what the different kinds of medias are in the field of communications. There's uh, three main types. There's earned media, which is word of mouth and third party recognition. So it's when a PR person will pitch a story to a journalist and they'll pick it up and run the story. Own media is controlled by the brand or the company. It's like their blog or their social media um, content from Facebook to Twitter. And then lastly, there's native advertising, which is also known as sponsored or promoted content. You'll see this on social media websites like Facebook. It'll say sponsored content on the bottom or promoted tweets. This is when um, PR professionals would pay for placements or third party reviews. Many people believe that native advertising is a new concept, but actually it began in the early 1900s with advertorials. Then the idea of native advertising grew into so much more. It became sponsored radio programs in the 1930s, branded TV in the 1940s and 50s, paying for commercial placements in the 1960s and 70s, infomercials in the 1980s, and search engine ads in the 1990s to the early 2000s. Today, we utilize social media and online news story websites for sponsored content and native advertising. PR professionals will pay for sponsored content to appear on Facebook, LinkedIn, and they'll even pay for sponsored and promoted tweets. News websites like Mashable and BuzzFeed also utilize native advertising and sponsored content, and they charge upwards of $400,000 for prime spots. There are pros and cons to native advertising. PR professionals will use native advertising because 25% more of consumers see native ads than regular posts and content, and 97% of mobile media buyers report effectiveness of native advertisements. Native advertisements also create 18% higher purchase rates than just banner ads alone. But there are also some negatives. Consumers view native ads as untruthful and misleading. 45% of consumers view promoted tweets on Twitter as misleading, where 57% of consumers viewed sponsored content on Facebook as misleading, and a large percentage, 86, thought that video ads were misle misleading. Because of these negatives, there are a lot of ethical concerns around native advertising. Editorial and promotional content can cause confusion. People don't know if it's paid for or if it was truly a third party reputation. PR professionals also have mixed feelings and ideas of what third party endorsements mean today. Do they pay for them or do they actually pitch it? But despite the negatives, Native advertising is very popular. Publishers are the main force behind the content use because 62% of publishers are currently offering native advertising space. 41% of brands will utilize native advertising and 34% of PR agencies use native advertising with their clients. And it's gonna continue to grow. 20% of brands will plan to add native advertising to their communications plans within the next year and 12% of agencies will offer native advertising tactics to their clients within the next year. So that leaves us to say, will you pitch or will you purchase your reputation? Thank you. While we're moving and and uh, rearranging ourselves. Let me explain how we're gonna work um, the Socratic Dialogue tonight. What we'll, I'll introduce the panelists to you and our famous interlocutor, or infamous interlocutor, and then um, 
we'll proceed with the actual crossfire itself. After the crossfire, um, we'll invite you to ask questions. Uh, Dr. Kim will be situated on this side of the auditorium, and, and Professor Moore, the two other professors who teach the course uh, with us, will be at coming into your, the audience and having you ask questions to the panelists, any or all of the panelists. Af after that time, we will adjourn to room 108, where our site committee has set up a lovely um, refreshments table for us. And I also want to mention our thanks to our sponsors. PRSSA is helping to sponsor the, the event tonight, as is Little Sicily. And we really are thankful for RTN, who comes and films this every year. And all the RTN staff are back there, and all of our uh, professional staff are helping us along. So we thank them all for coming. So without further ado, Shannon Smith, to my far right and your left, is a student. She is uh, not on the program because our, our student on the program is very ill. So Shannon is a dual major. She's an advertising and a public relations major and a, with an honors concentration. And that's all I'm going to say about her. For now, she is taking the position of a publisher for the purposes of the Socratic Dialogue. Professor Hackney is sitting seated next to her. He has worked for Exelon and Campbell's Soup, and he's taking the traditional PR practitioner role. He currently is an adjunct professor for us in our department, and we're grateful for that. Seated next to Dr. H or Professor Hackney is Dr. Basso, who is also a lawyer, and he's going to uh, represent the law perspective as he, uh, as he plays his role on the panel. Um, seated on this side of, of, the audio, of the panel is Dr. Hausman. Most of you know him as a journalism professor. He's also an ethicist and, and teaches media ethics, and he's going to represent kind of a dual position here as a journalist and a media expert, or a media ethicist expert, if I can say that. And uh, from the external perspective, we, we're joined tonight by Kathleen Tower, and we're grateful for her coming. She is a social media manager. So she's going to take the social media perspective or the new media perspective versus the traditional. So we're going to have a really nice discussion. And last but not least, our Charles Williams, our, another PR student, is actually going to take the position of a PR student. So without further ado, let me introduce our interlocutor. An interlocutor is like an MC, the MC of the Socratic Dialogue world. Uh, professor Fulginetti is, is a professor emeritus. He is returning to a, a returning just in time um, to do our panel this year, and we're really grateful that he came back. He really originated the, the Socratic dialogue at, that we've held here for some 20 plus years. 30 years. 30 years. So without further ado, he will take over and get the dialogue started. So again, welcome and thank you for coming. Great. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be back. It's cold up here. <laughs> but thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, ordinarily, <clears throat> a Socratic dialogue is an investigation through queries, questions, and I would be walking around talking to these different people. But since they gave me a seat, this is the crossfire setting in which we go at each other. But it's not that controversial this evening. So here's how we're going to cover this topic. There are three main players in this new phenomenon. The first player would be the public relations people. And our whole first segment will deal with the implications of sponsored content on PR. The second player are the journalists, and we will do slash publishers. These are the folks who will accept, publish, and even participate in creating these things. The third segment will deal with advertising and see what's happening in the advertising field and how, how the PR people and the advertisers get, are going to get along with the marketing director with this, this new stuff. Finally, time permitting, we'll have a small scenario about uh, measles vaccinations, where the Centers for Health want everybody to be vaccinated and perhaps some people for religious reasons or otherwise don't want to. And we'll see how some of our experts would use the new media to promote their issue. So we'll get started now with public relations. So I'm going to direct the questions to everybody, but we'll start with our veteran PR people that are here. Now, public relations is a profession. People define a profession as an occupation that contributes something more than just client satisfaction. It contributes to public interest. Is there any danger in using sponsored content that would cause public, public relations people to be viewed differently as maybe not contributing to the public interest anymore, but specifically to clients? David? Uh, yes. Now, is this on so I can? Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, I think there is a, uh, uh, a danger 
uh, a threat actually to public relations in that we will be absorbed uh, into the marketing function, that we will become uh, just a, an adjunct to marketing, that uh, the control will be out of our hands. Uh, I think this whole issue as a traditional public relations partner, practitioner, the whole issue of native advertising is something we should be concerned about. The, there is a reason why there's been this separation between church and state, between advertising and public relations, is because public relations it clearly has credibility while advertising has a different role. Uh, and I think that the, the end consumer of the information is going to be skeptical when they realize that this, this piece of information they've just been reading, which looks like news, turns out to be sponsored. I mean, I, I read a piece in the, in the Atlantic uh, magazine uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, excellent article on, or looked excellent, on the issue of women in prison. Uh, it was well researched, it seemed objective, but it was only after reading it I realized it was sponsored by Netflix promoting Orange is the New Black. And you felt what? And I felt used, I felt duped. Duped? Yeah. Joe, um, if I may, the, the um, PRSA sometimes puts out advisories when new things arise as adjuncts to the PRSA Code of Ethics. And what they said in the September 2014 advisory was that public relations still must create informed opinions and rational decisions. Now, here's the problem here. If we propagandize people, and PR participates in this, is it really uh, reneging on its responsibility to the public interest by not helping people make rational decisions anymore? but rather control decisions based upon a dupe or something that's supposed to appear to be objective and so forth? And are they really informed if they're getting one side of the story? Uh, they used to get that anyway sometimes with PR, even in the old modes. But is this a danger now that we can't fulfill the mandate? I, I think what, what this does is it sets public relations back 100 years. And you know if we look at the, the evolution of our profession, can you uh, if you look at the evolution of our profession, going back to the P.T. Barnum days, this, this really smacks of, of almost being Barnum-esque because on a more sophisticated level where they're manipulating publics, we're not, we're not serving our role as a boundary spanner where we're, hmm. we're representing not only the organization to the publics but the public back to the organization. We have a duty to both, and I think when we're, as David said, we become just a function of marketing now. It's, it really does, it, it, it takes away everything that we are really supposed to do from an ethical standpoint and to protect the citizens of, in a democratic society. That, that, that's really interesting. Are you saying that this mode is causing PR people to be more asymmetric, just one way out, the way advertisers mm -hmm. do, and not to come back? And much, much more, because we're going to be judged now on our placement. And how much? How much did, did we actually sway public decisions, as opposed to creating dialogue and letting publics make informed decisions? Because our job to sub, to provide relevant information. And if we're doing wrong, then we should have the role to counsel the organization to do things that are better. Really, we we're, we're becoming nothing more than you know in that integrated mode. We're we're losing our identity. Carl. When the PR people in the old days sent out a news release and they had a story embedded in it, uh, much, uh, much like these stories with, uh, controlled, with the controlled media, the editor used to edit it and then run it. Was not the editor in the old days also asserting the authenticity of the story and endorsing it and getting what these folks always wanted, which was third party credibility? Is that going to get better, worse, or diminish? Well, I mean, it's, it, it, with native advertising, it's, it's, it's gone. Uh, the editor would uh, deal with the per public relations person whom he trusted. And let me just pause for a sip of Acadia spring water, <laughs> <laughs> which Brought is delicious and refreshing. <laughs> they, paid? Paid, they, they, paid for they paid me fifty dollars for that. Now, don't, <laughs> don't we all feel dirty? <laughs> um, so yes, there was the transaction where, uh, when I was in news and I would deal with public relations people all the time, and I was in public relations for a time, 
also. And uh, the stories that I got were vetted by me and vetted by the PR people because the last thing they wanted to do was hang me with some clunker story or have me lie because I would never come back to them again. So there was a minuet there that um, I think ensured some authenticity into the story. Uh, all that has gone with native advertising. Now, I don't really know how many people know, na native advertising is defined in a lot of different ways. Native advertising is basically advertising camouflaged as news. It's a story that looks like news and it's hidden sometimes on the bottom of the page. It says more from the web or, uh, or other cryptic things like this. You may want to know more. But then it leads you to something like uh, 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 10 great ways to clean your house. And then if you read through it, you find out it's written by Swiffer. Uh, the, the Atlantic has gone big into this. The Atlantic had a uh, Scientology piece that was sponsored by the Church of Scientology. Why they put it in Atlantic, I don't know. It might have been in Depressed Actor Monthly better. But, but uh, that's, that, that <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Nobody got it, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. Got applause should, for the land. Yeah, should I say it again? No, anyway. But, um, it's not many people with a warped sense of humor. I know, I know. They're all over there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it looks like news, but it's but it's not. And uh, why do they do this? Well, the answer is obvious. Uh, banner advertising just has not worked at all. Uh, studies have shown that something like two two percent of one percent, point zero zero two percent of people actually intentionally click on a banner ad. So that's going nowhere. But. Native advertising, native content, native means it looks like the environment which it's in, could pass for uh, the environment which it's in, uh, has been very successful in the absence of anything else. BuzzFeed uh, is 100% funded by native content, and it's a $4 billion industry. So, so the answer, uh, I, I went around the barn twice there, but the answer is yes. There was some guarantee of authenticity in the old-fashioned transaction. Uh, there, there's very little of this now, and in fact, it, it sort of warps the whole perception from the beginning because the intent is to fool people. I don't care what anybody says, the intent is to fool people. There's we're gonna, no other way for it. We're going to come back to that uh, when we come to the publisher's uh, segment as well. Um, Shen, um, just to go back to maybe comfort these folks here a little bit, if public relations is supposed to manage the reputation of a company, is not the use of these new techniques also sending out the culture, the ethos, the reputation of, of, of a, com of a um, company? In other words, if they went to the marketing director and said, we're still doing our job, we're just doing it in a different mode. We are selling reputation, and reputation sells, and culture sells. In fact, I guess you heard that the word of the year from Merriam-Webster is culture the most looked up word all year long from, from everybody. So if you're selling culture, are you still doing PR? I think that as a publisher, publishers really rely on having a good balance between the native advertising and traditional PR approaches. Because the native advertising, it does offer an income, especially in this industry that's getting smaller. A lot of people aren't buying newspapers. They aren't buying, um, you know, they're watching the news on TV. They're getting it on the internet. And I think for publishers, they do want a sense of both and that the, the native advertising also does send a message. Um, most publishers will put the sponsored content on the bottom and the user will know, wow, this company paid for this spot, but this next article I read, the company didn't pay for that spot. So it does give an objective. Well, as a publisher, you always have had kind of a mixed relationship with the PR people anyway, right? Yes. Are, is this new ammunition for you to say you folks are selling your soul or calm down? I'm participating in this too, so as long as you're doing your job selling reputation, we'll let the advertiser sell the products. Are you going to be any, <coughs> any more um, at odds with them or are you, do you think you'd be more in line with them? I think this will make publishers and PR people more in line with one another. What do you think, Kathleen? More in line because PR still says, I'm still selling reputation that sells Nordstrom, FedEx, sells on reputation. I do think it would make them more in line with each other. Um, 
I think that the author of the native advertising still has the responsibility to make sure that what they're putting out there is honest and truthful, um, but at the same time sells their brand. So I think that there is a way for native advertising to work for both the publisher and the PR practitioner. Uh, as a student at Rowan University, mm -hmm. Charles, you certainly know about Newsom, Earl Newsom's principles of persuasion. You remember <laughs> the old FICA, familiarity, identification, and so on? Mm -hmm. Is not this new approach getting very familiar with the audience in a way that banner ads perhaps didn't, or maybe going through the publisher who had to endorse the story before, before, it, uh, before it ran? Are they not uh, getting very familiar? And the second one, I, identification, some of this interactive stuff, is it not allowing the people to identify with the company more than some of the old methods? Um, yeah, it is, it is allowing um, for both. Um, I think these new methods um, do help with both um, the publishing and um, for the for the PR. Um. <laughs> well, persuasion yeah, is persu the name of the game yeah. for the public relations people, for the advertisers, and so they need to they need to use the best uh, persuasion techniques. And if they can tell the marketing director, this is the best technique that we know for now. Mm -hmm. It's less begging of Carl and his folks to get the stuff in. They just place it. Content is king. And who said that? Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates. Content is king. And they're going to tell their uh, marketing director, we can really lay out the content. We can really set our company up better than ever before. Would you be squeamish about that at all? Getting in bed with the advertisers and the publishers? No, I think it's good. Good. I think it's good um, for, for both of them. Um, I ask, um, oh, David. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of the so called purposes of this uh, native advertising, according to the advertisers, and we'll get to those folks in a minute, but according to them, it's not necessarily to sell a product then and there when this content appears, it's to make typhoid Marys convert people convert them to the reputation, convert them to the brand. So they go out, and this wonderful little word that appeared in our literature, the virality starts. It becomes a virus. They would probably rather have it as a virus than a single sale, and that makes it much more powerful. Ab ab absolutely, and yet there's still the, can you, you, you say that you know, the advertisers are putting this together, this native advertising, and they're not looking to make an immediate sale. Okay. What concerns me, though, and I think uh, Kathleen made a reference to it, the material that an advertiser is going to write isn't going to be one where anything negative about the issue is going to be put in. The Scientology art, uh, article had nothing about the controversies involving Scientology. Yeah. It had a link to the Scientology uh, website, and that's all, all, Scienti all the Scientologists were trying to do is make people a little more comfortable. They're not all crazy Tom Cruises. Uh, but the fact that the advertiser is leaving out critical material that the journalists would look for. I think is where uh, we're running into ethical problems and we're running into problems where we're misleading the public. Well, well, this does ask us to ask Dr. Basso, then the conscience of the corporation that sits around the table, we think it's PR. Is it time now for the public relations people to be agnostic about the channels and maybe to help influence the advertisers by telling, even in a story, part of the other side to make it more credible. Can we be agnostic or do we have to stick to the old strains of PR? What would prevent us from being more open to this? The, 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 the societies, the professors, 
uh, the media people? What would prevent us? It's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's our ethical duty to, to operate in the best interest of our, of our publics. You know, advertising, and not to demean advertising, but as a role, it has a role in, in even our profession in public relations and disseminating information. But, you know, even from a legal standpoint, we'll look and, and accept a certain element of puffery Puffery, what what the average person would would believe, oh, well, really could be really not really true. That's okay, but when we start to cross that line where we blur it and people are, ooh, now we're taking this as gospel truth. I th I think what we've done is we we've actually not only committed an eth ethical issue here, we have a legal issue because now we've destroyed the commercial speech doctrine. We said. We're tricking publics, in essence, by excluding information. It's that selective information that, that, we're, that we're leaving out. I think it's really problematic. I think it really it so, damages our profession. So PR likely. could help make these messages less propagandistic than if they were not involved in them? PR could make it if it showed both sides, if it, if it, didn't, if it was able to get relevant information. But... You know, the, the symbiotic relationship, I think, that always existed between journalism and public relations was that they were watching us. You know, we, we had a role to play in, get, in, in getting information out, to, out through that third-party endorsement, but they had a role to play in policing us, which, which made us better. We did things that were in the public interest. And... As long as I'm telling all sides of my story, yes, I can be persuasive, but I also need to be factual, and I can't. If I, I'm very if with I, you, David. The very problem, with you. very quickly, the problem with becoming agnostic is the person who's paying your salary is not going to want you to be agnostic. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, you want me to take this that I'm paying for and put in things that undermine my argument? I, I can I can just say I do. That's a not going to go that way. I dealt a lot with nuclear power. I can see if I said, well, you know, we ought to put in about nuclear waste and how it lasts for ten thousand years. They said, you know, there's a door over there. You can don't let it hit you. Uh, and I'll I'll end with you with the PR segment of of this by by asking you, um, PRSA for years has had the criterion that you cannot join the society unless you spent the bulk of your time in public relations. Now if they join the advertisers and the publishers and they cease to look like PR people and more like quasi PR people, quasi advertisers, what do you think the society, the, the, what do you think the profession, will it relax and, and now broaden the definition or will it clamp down? I think PRSA has to take a close look at where it will be in five or ten years, as any organization has to. And I think they, I, I don't have the answer for them on whether they're going to have to start uh, Come up with one. Figuring out that, What do you well, think they should do? What's it? What do you think they should do? I, well, I think they should try for as long as possible to keep the standards they have now. If they start finding, though, that they can't, have as many members, you know, the old guys like me end up shuffling off uh, this mortal coil and new people coming in are half advertising and half PRSS, PR, uh, public relations, I think PRSA is going to have to look and say, what kind of organization are we going to be? Are we going to be a mixed organization? Oh. Everybody, everybody has to uh, think of where they might be in five or ten years. So we could be called Prads sometime in the be. future. We could be. Yeah. All right. so we just keep defining our deviance down. That's all. I'm, I'm coming back to you folks in a second. We're going to start with the publisher on this end. Shannon, a very simple, basic question for this whole seminar. Why is it important for consumers to know the difference between editorial content and sponsored content? Why is it so important? And we'll get to that disclosure point in just a second. It's important because it goes to the, the fundamental that the journalist is giving that third party recommendation versus that that company paid for that spot. And consumers should know that, you know, well, the company paid to have this spot in the newspaper. It's there, I read it, you know, maybe I enjoyed it, maybe I didn't, but they need to know that it was placed there because ethically speaking, 
you know, there's a difference between buying a reputation and pitching a reputation. But if you get the reputation, does and it matter? It does. I think it does matter. Right, let's ask Carl a second about this. And Joe, we're going to have to come back to you after we get the answer, I think, um, to, to this question. Carl, then, what, if, if it's going to be the consumer, does the consumer have a right to know that there's a difference? Or is it just nice that they know a difference? Or is it good marketing if they don't know a difference? It's all three. Did you ever see the comedian uh, John Oliver on HBO? Mm -hmm. He had a great line. He did a rant about native advertising, and he said, it's "Great, you know, it was a great piece." Yeah, I said, uh, uh, two of my favorite things are guacamole and uh, Twizzlers. Separately, they're terrific. You put them together, not so much. And when you combine these two different things, you get something that's very unsatisfying to everybody. You get a type of information that no one is quite sure if it's true or if it's coming from a biased source. Uh, if I were to tell you that Carl Hausman is the most informative, entertaining person on the face of the earth, you're getting from a biased source. It's true, but but you're getting it. But but you're getting from a bad source, and 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 you would want some balance on that. But ultimately, what I think is happening, this is a nice stopgap now because uh, news revenues are are falling precipitously. Everyone knows that. And this is a way that, uh, that we can make money. But I think it's poisoning the well. And by that I mean is, right now, you have a viable product in native advertising because people haven't figured it out yet quite. It looks like news, but as soon as the news becomes suspect and the native advertising becomes suspect, the whole selling point that you have, the, the fact that, it, that it's, it, it looks like news and comes from a news source, is gone. So Do they have a right, Carl? Under the First Amendment, they have a right to do pretty much whatever they want to. Do they have an obligation? No, no, I'm, yeah. no, I'm not, not talking to yeah. the, the seminaries. I'm talking about the consumers. Do they have a right to know the difference? Um, that's not written into any law I'm aware of, but I think morally they do. They do so have a right to question. know the difference. I think it's an ethical question. And, uh, and, and yes, people need information to navigate their lives. They have to have accurate information. Um, and when they're getting bogus information from, from uh, uh, talk shows, with, you know, because I'll, I'm going to be on the bad end of, of the discussion later on, but the uh, debate, for example, about inoculations, vaccinations, uh, yeah, they have a right to that information. And, and people who disseminate it when it's wrong, I think, have an obligation, maybe not a legal but a moral obligation, to question some of these whack jobs that they have on TV uh, just spouting stuff that's totally unproven, in fact, completely disproven, and it's causing deaths among uh, uh, infants and, and elderly people but and others. Right. But they have a right. It's, uh, Joe, a quick, a quick response to that. It would seem that the PRSA advisory says that people should make informed decisions. Does that lead to an ethical yes, that they have such a right, at least from the, the PR person's point of view? I don't know what the advertiser would say. Ethically, ethically, we have a duty to get to inform the publics to the best of our ability. Um, where Carl said he's not sure if it's really a legal issue, you know, I think that the, you know, if you look at the commercial speech doctrine, which I had mentioned before, that it will that it will say that the First Amendment protects things that are may may not be fully true, but to what extent? When we start to go across that line where those comments could, could cause damage to people, could be so misleading that could lead to real problems in society. We have, a, we have not only just an, an ethical problem, we have a legal problem, and so, that's our goal. Right, 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 I just have to ask Kathleen a question. So Kathleen, based upon the comment of our two physicians, lawyers, native advertising is unethical. True or false? It depends. Um, that wasn't one of the choices. <laughs> I think You're going to run for office someday. I'll vote for you. Um, there are some websites where you go, you go, you see a story, and you, like you said before with the Orange is the New Black story, you don't know until the end of the story that it was sponsored. There are other websites you go to, and it's plastered across the top of the website, sponsored content. Well, when it's plastered across the top like that, I know it's an ad, and I, I think most people should or eventually will recognize that sponsored content means it's an ad. Um, so I personally don't even read them. So I think that the ones that it's, it's very clear this is 
native advertising, this is sponsored content, I think that's ethical because then that's that's just as ethical as a regular advertisement so we're, is. So we're going to come to disclosure in a second. So, mm -hmm. so you think that if they disclose, mm -hmm. it sanitizes the shell game, the mouse trap that this thing is? Because a lot of people think it's exactly that. It's a bait, right. get you in, and then you don't know un until you see some one word and agate type somewhere that is mm -hmm. sponsored or promoted. I do, because I, I think if somebody's watching TV and they see a commercial, they know that was paid for. They know that's coming from the company. If somebody's reading a magazine and they flip to an advertisement, they know it's an advertisement that was paid for. I think native advertising is a new kind of advertising that people don't quite understand. So I think as long as it's out there that this is an ad that people can recognize that that's an ad, I think it's just as ethical as a commercial or Maybe. radio. Charles, mm -hmm. so they're sinning and asking for forgiveness in the same piece. <laughs> well, um, I mean, as a student, as a consumer, I don't think it's it's fine if there is some kind of disclosure, but I think for a consumer, eh, I don't know if they're really going to pay so much mind to that. Um, so, I mean, I, I pay I, mind to what? No, to, not so much to what? To um, yeah, to, to the fact to, that to they're the sponsored being content. that is sponsored content. Yeah. You don't think they pay much attention to? It. Well, some, some of the research also says it's some not that do, effective. Some do, but I think um, a majority of consumers. I don't know if they if they're really gonna. Okay, so they slap your face and then they say I'm sorry, and you're okay if they say they're sorry. <laughs> Are you okay, Shannon? Um, well, I mean, I think that sponsored content. I, yes, it should be written on there, but I think consumers still enjoy sponsored content. Look at the popularity no of doubt. BuzzFeed, look at the popularity of Mashable, like, or even uh, promoted tweets or sponsored posts on Facebook. They pop up because it you know, has something to do with interest. Maybe you liked that page, or maybe you liked a story that was similar. Okay, I just want to get your quick response. So, <laughs> so they know it and it's okay, or they don't know it? What's I being done to that? I think most um, Con I think most consumers now, especially younger generation consumers, are aware that it is sponsored content. I, I'm not sure that you know older demographics are aware that it's sponsored content um, right away. But I mean, as as you know, you know, most PR students here and advertising students here, they they re will recognize the sponsored content. But uh, David, may, may I just put my sure, professor's right. hat back on for a second? My uh, public talk to Carl's point about how it can uh, be undermining confidence in the media. Uh, my students had to do a paper in which they had to interview people, four at least four people, and one of the questions they had to ask was about trusting the media. And so that's 88 interviews out of 22 people, four interviews each. Three people said, "Yeah, I trust the media." The rest were saying, oh, no, I just don't. Now, there's not just, that's not just because of native advertising. There's a lot of, but I think part of it is they're not sure what the heck they're getting. Who's, who is giving them this? Is somebody sponsoring it? Is there some other issue behind it? And I was shocked to see 88 interviews that I read, and three people said, yeah, I trust the media. So the gatekeeper is not trusted. The gatekeeper is now going to be opening the gate to some different stuff. Will it create more or less trust, Joe. Well, uh, uh, the premise to this is not only are the publishers looking at the stuff, saying amen to it, and accepting the placement. We're, we're, I'm not sure about the law on accepting all placements, but they're accepting the placement. They have gone so far, Forbes and some other companies, to have separated inside their companies, divisions, editorial on one side, we'll call it the church, and the state on the other side, We'll call it the business side. And now they have journalists with PR people, with advertisers, making these things. And they say, OK, we're separate from the other side. But now it's everybody's doing this together, and it's OK? Publics are so inundated with information that, you know, Shannon brought up the point that you know she that younger generations, uh, this younger generations and older generations. Um, I think one of the problems we have with younger generations is they're probably not and not not trying to be um, 
the meaning, but at this point in their life, not sophisticated enough to want to go out to, to understand the distinction between something that is purely manipulative or a half-truth. And some of the older generations are probably too lazy to always be out there digging up information. So where that puts us in public relations is, we're sort of at that middle that we have a duty. And, and I keep going back to that same issue that we have to protect not only the, the profession, I think, but publics, at, publics in general. That advertising serves a purpose, but when we have now advertising being disguised as public relations, being some gospel truth, we have we, we, we manipulated society. We haven't persuaded, and that's the big distinction. Well, uh, Kathleen, on, on that same topic, isn't, as we mentioned earlier when I was speaking with Carl, isn't it really just old-fashioned? They're looking at content. They're maybe participating in it, editing the news release. Then they're taking the placement, allowing it to go through the gate. Are they not just doing what they've always done? And they should be held not accountable. It, it is a little bit different. Um, well, it, it's very different from what they've always done. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily so much more unethical than traditional practices. Um, I've worked in the beauty industry and the PR for beauty, we send free products to the journalists. Is that not paying for your placement? Could be. So I don't, I personally don't see a difference in that and native advertising. Carl then, a big question for tonight. One of the, what we'll call recommendation questions, which we'll maybe summarize with. Should J schools now have a course in how to cooperate with public relations and advertisers to make native advertising? Yes, and it shouldn't be an advocacy horse saying doing it, but do it, uh, but it should be a course that says this is the situation, this is what you may be called upon to do. I don't have any problem at all with native advertising as long as it's identified. I mean, the news business has never been a bunch of preachers. Uh, we're not Billy Graham. I mean, the, the, the first television newscast uh, began, sit back and light up a camel and be an eyewitness to the events of the day with a camel news caravan. Uh, many car magazines, by pure coincidence, when they wrote a favorable review of a car, they happened to have a $10,000 page ad for that car. I, I can't think it was coincidence. Um, search engine optimization is used extensively by news uh, to, to basically trick people into, into clicking on it. When I worked in television news, we would have stories, I'm not making this up, because, because the thing that you that dread most is people tuning out during the commercial. Your, whole, your commercials are put in first. The rest of the program is built around it to keep people from one segment to the other. And one was, is your bagel killing you? We'll find out after this. <laughs> well, well, okay. So it turned out that that there had been a spate of people cutting themselves, cutting bagels, uh, and and the, the local emergency room had seen a lot of this. So that was what we did. You know, was it honest? Was it great journalism? Is it going to win a Pulitzer Prize? No, it's a little bit tricky. So I see a little bit of room for that. I mean, it's a competitive business. Joe, course in PR, or is it in the ethics portion of the course in PR? <laughs> Embedded in the ethics portion. Okay, Shannon. Shannon, if um, if the um, uh, journalism code says do no harm, it's one of their tenets. Does the publisher have an obligation to look at the paid placement to see if, in the publisher's opinion, it benefits society and that it does no harm? Are they? And by the way, Joe, I'll ask you a follow. Are they allowed to do that? to not accept some paid placements? I think um, ultimately the publisher will have the final say. And I mean, if they received a paid placement that was absolutely ridiculous, maybe they might not consider running it in their, their paper and refunding them and giving, you know, not taking the money for it. But it's more of a transaction kind of business rather than um, a pitched Business. Well, here comes the question then. Is it journalism? 
is it faux journalism? If it's journalism, does the code apply and they have to disclose? If it's faux journalism, does the code apply or does it not apply? Because I, this is now a business transaction. I think it's a business transaction. I, I don't think that it's journalism. I would not consider native advertising journalism at all. That would probably be one of the last things. Can I get I a quick consider. go around on that? Yes or no? Is it journalism or not? Um, I no. 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 Can be. Some of it's pretty good. Can be? No. 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 Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting little study. Okay. Um, so, despite the fact that it is a paid placement, Charles, can the editor go further and in disclosure than he thinks the sponsor went? So the sponsor sends you the copy. He's got this little word that says, sponsored by, promoted by. I'm weakening my voice to make the type get smaller. <laughs> or even the voice gets smaller, or it's placed at the end. Does the uh, publisher have an, a right, an obligation, or a duty to blast that so he feels clean, or she? Yeah, if it's a, going back to if it's a business transaction, I mean, um, I think it, it's only right. Um, oh, know, so the business people have to have ethics too. Because this is a yeah. disclosure statement saying, we're trying to fool you, but we're trying to fool you. Yeah. And we're telling you that, so it's okay if we tell you that. Carl, what do you think about that? Can they demand more disclosure than the sponsor wanted? Well, yes, well, I think that's key. I think that's key to making the whole enterprise work. I mean, we had, when I worked in public relations, I, I would write full-fledged stories that people reprinted often word for word verbatim in fairly yes. large newspapers. And uh, while I was doing an obvious <coughs> service, it was the Syracuse University that I worked in. And I would do stories, I would interview a uh, pediatrician about what to do if, you tr if your child is stuttering. Uh, I, interviewed, um, uh, uh, I interviewed a nutritionist on how to get more iron in your blood by, by cooking with iron frying pans. It really works. So the, the self-benefit was clear in that, but it was still a legitimate story. And the AP actually ran some of these. They said it came from Syracuse University. Everybody's part in that transaction was visible and transparent. Everyone could see what was being gained. And we made no effort to go to Vanderbilt and say, well, what do you think about this? So I think to that extent, it's, it's okay as long as it's disclosed or at least obvious to the consumer. So Joe, if these people, if you people send something to the publisher and he thinks it's not worthy, he's made a judgment on its authenticity. If you send something to the publisher and he judges or she judges, it is worthy. It's made a judgment on its authenticity. They're still the gatekeepers. So does placing it give you any more leverage than begging for it before because you're offering money on the table now? Placing it absolutely is going to give you that leverage because the buck will never take second place. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to be dealing with. And, you know, we, we could be... We could be virtuous all we want, that our message is pure, but if we've, if we've not identified it as being placed there, that we paid for that space, our, our motives are not pure. And, and, I, and I believe truly that we need to do that. The role that journalism plays as a gatekeeper, while oftentimes frustrating the public relations, is an absolute necessity because it's going... It, Providing they're doing their role correctly, but this diminishes now, it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, David. I think some of it, whether the publisher or broadcaster accepts it, is going to depend on the financial situation that the outlet finds itself. That they got themselves involved I, in that in the first place. I, you know, hate being a cynic, but if they need the money, they very well might take it. I, we used to, uh, I used to do public affairs ads for Pico. Channel Six would sometimes push back. Channel Six had a lot of advertising. Channel 10 would say, well, hey, whatever you want, we'll take it. So so we'll finish up with you on the journalism section, yeah. David. Um, so you're the public relations director for a publisher. And this is a new revenue stream that's, that your organization has suddenly discovered. If, if this is so, do you think that the publication gains its reputation by virtue of these stories, 
that the consuming public finds so appealing and attractive and interactive, and then they love the pub. Because after all, native is conforming to a particular form, a particular publication, a particular place in the publication. Do they gain by doing this? The, does the publisher gain? Yes. Uh, I, think, I think the publisher can see some financial gain, but does run the risk that at some point people might say, I don't trust it. No, I'm not interested in financial gain. We okay. know that oh. reputation reputational gain. gain. Okay, reputation gain, I think they run a, a, a high risk. Risk. Carl, does your pub not improve because you're placing stories that people love? No. No, no I don't think so. I, I think that sooner or later you'll lose all credibility in the news. That, that's all we have. That's the only thing that we sell. Anybody can sell words. Uh, we have to sell credibility. Without that, we don't have but a product. You, but you say the news is dying. Yes. The way people consume news is eroding, ending, fading away. And now this is the new way. So you fight? I'd say it's a necessary evil. If I were confronted with this and someone came to me and said, well, here's a great way we're going to do it, I would hold my nose and say, okay, let's do it, but let's make sure that it's hygienically identified as best we can. And um, again, I don't have any allergy to uh, this type of native advertising as long as people know what it is. I get very antsy when it's passed off as something else because it's, it's deliberate obfuscation. So if there is a discussion inside the publisher's corporation as to whether or not they should do it, can you or someone make the argument that it really does help us reputationally? Our pub gains if we accept the kinds of copy our consumers Reputationally, like. no, but we'll be out of business if we don't. Right. That's an interesting answer. That's, that's an, okay. I, I that's, agree completely. You agree completely? Yeah. Oh, that's dangerous. No, yeah. that's, that's, that doesn't help Well, me. there goes the I'm whole sorry. premise. Yeah. <laughs> he just <laughs> made a good point. <laughs> and you're probably not going to be for measles vaccinations pretty right. soon either. Okay, let's switch to the advertisers. Now, these are the folks that are doing this stuff, and they have now reached out with one hand and grabbed the PR people. They've reached out with the other hand and grabbed the publishers, and they said, we told you all along that this was the way to do it. But not banner ads, no, now stories. Why? Because people, adults, learn best through stories. They know that persuasion theory. And so now they're gonna say, you PR people come up with the stories, and you, you journalists, you help us because you're great writers, and we'll place it and everybody will get along. So is sponsored content, Joe, a hybrid? Is it both advertising and editorial, or is it pure advertising? It's pure advertising. You're gonna go down no matter what with this yes, ship, right? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> you don't see any editorial <clears throat> content I mean, after all, the advertisers coming to the PR people right. saying, we always liked you. We're here to get your stuff, your content. Give us your content. We'll do the reputation. We'll right, get it but placed. But it's not vetted then. It's not because if it's not You're vetting it. But it's not identified. It has to be identified as, as an advertisement, as a paid message. How would you do it? It's, uh, it's going to happen, right? They come to you. Mm -hmm. The advertisers say, I got this great idea. Carl's got this pub. We're going to place it. I want you to participate in making this. Now, what provisos do you want to put down? What guarantees do you want? You're going to do it or you're going to get fired? You're going to give them the content? I lose my BMW? <laughs> parking <laughs> um, space. Yeah, right, my parking space. Uh, I don't even have a BMW. Um, I, think it's real, I think it's a real challenge. I think it's presented probably the, the, the greatest challenge in my career in public relations because it is, it, it goes against my duty to publics or my duty to the organization. And I think that a pure public relations person needs to have a duty to both and it need, and needs to be able to stand up. And we're sort of selling our, our soul. Kathleen, in essence. for a moment, can you be the PR person's boss? Okay, okay you're the marketing director. He doesn't want to do it. Can you tell him why it's okay? It's in keeping with what he does every day. He's going to sell reputation. Just go along with it, Joe. I mean, I think it's okay because I, I think it's the same as any other ad. Um, I, I personally think it's an ad. Um, 
I, I could see how there is a bit of editorial in it. Um, but do you, do you sense telling. his objection? Can you go after his objection? He's, he's uneasy about this. Can you make him easy? As long as we let the consumer know that it's an ad, that it was paid for, I don't see the problem with it. No problem, Joe. That's no all problem. you have to do is disclose, all right? All you have to do is disclose. That's and so, you're so the great the discloser. Public, so the public knows, mm -hmm. that's all. Then you're all right with it. Then I'm okay with it because then, because then it's incumbent on the public's then to determine whether that is information, whether, whether that's information that is usable or whether they need other information to make an informed decision. Okay, here comes, is, oh, is Carl, there one thing that I could add to that? I don't want to take too much time looking oh. at my Scotchin uh, on this watch, <laughs> manly but accurate. Um, there's one part of the equation that is left out between public relations and news, and that's if anybody needs public relations now, it's news, because when we talk about the fact that what we have is credibility, I don't think most people know that. News has done the worst job of promoting itself of any industry in all of history. We all know that pork is the other white meat. We all know that uh, if you can't swallow your graham crackers, you can buy milk. But we do absolutely nothing to educate the public to the benefits of news and why we need it to survive in a society. So if there were going to be some great media confluence of professions, it would be public relations and news with public relations instructing us on how to get it across to people, why they have to have it, why it was written into the Constitution, and why it's vitally important to paint a picture of reality in which the citizen can act. Uh, David, um, yes. there's a big change coming here. I'm not sure about this, but, but I, think, I think it's the way it's happening is that the advertising in the past, the approach to consumers, was in the third person. Now with native advertising, they want it to be interactive engaging, identifying with the consumer, so the consumer bites on it. And these, all these words now are, again, from Newsom's principles, identify, familiar, right. Right. all of that stuff. So na na advertising, native advertising, makes the brand authentic because consumers endorse it when they read the content. Isn't this, advertising has now morphed into a First person, us, well, you, me, first and second person instead of the product, do it. It's out there. I see where that's going. My concern is we're all going to be BuzzFeed then. And BuzzFeed does a great job of putting everything or putting things into, you know, 10 things to do on a first date, uh, 20 things not to do on a first date. So how would you stop it from becoming BuzzFeed? What's your well, recommendation? Well, the, as a public relations practitioner, um, I, the, the, I don't know if you can stop it because that's the direction it's going to go in. Do you think it'll corrupt? I absolutely think it'll corrupt. Anybody here think it'll corrupt? Corrupt the professionals and the consumers? Is it a corrupting thing? It may be practical. But is it corrupting? Well, it's corrupting in that it erodes the base of knowledge that we have. Um, if we don't know what's true, and we hear a lot of this now, see, well, this may not be true, but it proves a larger, larger truth. Okay. But if we don't know what the smaller truths are, we don't know what the larger truth is. And we have to have something we can believe. So we have to Carl, have some vetted information. Are you thinking then that there's a greater tendency in these ads to allow the people to think that it's true, and so a greater tendency for people to sneak falsehoods into the ad, where before there were laws governing it? Well, sure. I mean, why would they do it? That The, the piece that I think we both saw with John Oliver, uh, he was saying, well, this is kind of, for these media executives to get up, which they do and say, well, no, people can tell the difference. It's foolish. It's like, uh, it's like getting somebody who manufactures camouflage going on TV and saying, only a fool couldn't tell camouflage from foliage. Well, of course. I mean, that's the whole purpose of it. So, so yeah, it, it, it does erode that, that, whole, uh, that whole wall. And, and you know, we're not, we're not sacred on this. There are many things that we do that are purely for the sake of, of ratings. I mean, if you watch television, you will see a format in which there is a 60-year-old gray-haired man with a 25-year-old blonde in every city. Why does that work? No one really knows, but it does. It's a format. 
uh, the music. It gives wow. hope to sixty-year-old men. <laughs> yeah, not me, but anyway. Uh, but but these things these things work, and and we take advantage of what works. And uh, but we try to just leave ourselves enough of an out for people to believe that we are sincere in telling them the truth. There is an answer to this question from the research. Let's see if anybody comes up with it or you come up with your own answer. If it survives and thrives, why would it? And the answer has to do with the consumer. So we'll take a turn. We'll come down the table. Shannon, if it survives and thrives, why will it? Um, I think if it, if it survives, it'll be surviving because that's what people enjoy reading and that's what people enjoy hearing about and just be, it will thrive on popularity um, and they might more than be. more than you know credibility I mean I I don't know some sponsored content I go online and I read it because I feel like reading about you know that topic you know I it's all right, all right David I think it might survive why would it I, th I think it, I, I'm sorry I think it will survive and that's my fear uh, I'm afraid that people will gravitate more to the sponsored content because it does talk in the first person and ignore the stories that are really the red meat, the stories they need to know, the stories, we, the things we need to know to have a functioning society and not just going to BuzzFeed and... So it's going to say, satisfy the public. Yeah, yeah. Joe? But it's like having ice cream all the time. You can't have ice cream all the time. You'll get sick Why and not? die, but who will, you know, <laughs> why? Well, not, I don't want pork, even though it's the white meat. <laughs> I think it's going to survive because consumers are lazy. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty sense. close to that researcher's mm -hmm. definition, which I'll reveal in a second. Okay. Good. Carl? It'll survive because it's an economic model that works. Not all yeah. do. When there is media disruption, when, when radio was first invented, the experts said to radio people, no one's going to buy anything off radio, you can't remember anything. Uh, but radio finally experimented with some 30 second advertisements and, and it worked. So that's what made it thrive. And now, for lack of anything else, all the other economic models are, are disintegrating because of Google, because of search advertising. So search advertising works, uh, uh, paid content works. So for the time being, until something else comes along, it'll work just because it's viable. Yeah. So the money will drag the people on it. will, yes. What do you think? I also think it'll survive, and I, I do think it, it'll be because it works. Um, I think that reading a list of 10 things is easier than going and reading an article. That's close to article. the answer the researcher found, close to what Joe was saying. Too. Yeah. And more profitable because you get clicked click 10 times. Mm -hmm. You get 10 more sets of ads every time you go mm -hmm. through it. People never get back to the original right. reason that they were yeah. searching. What do you think? Uh, it will survive. It gets the people going, and they're going to keep it going moving forward. The researcher found that it will survive because of the public's fragmented attention span. Yeah. They just can't read big stories in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. They want to bite and run, bite and run, and these are little bites. Six things of this and seven. You can even get off if you read three of them. You don't even have to stay because down at the bottom are another eight things you should know about. And people just spend all day learning all these things. Okay. So the most influential people in society are going to be headline writers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all people will read. Don't they do that now? Well. <laughs> okay. We are going to, do I have time for a small, small scenario? Okay. The issue, there is an issue here of measles. It's starting to appear again. And what they need, what the uh, uh, health officials want are, is everybody vaccinated. They need to get to 92.6% of the, what they call the herd, the population, in order to guarantee immunity for everybody. But some people have an objection to becoming immunized. There are some tales, tale, I don't want to prejudice it, there are some st uh, statements out there that people could get autism or people have religious objection to it. So I'm going to ask these two folks here, not Shannon, she's going to rule on it in a second, to come up with some native advertising tactic that you think would persuade people to get the advertising and, as good PR people, overcome their objections. You guys, for just a couple of seconds, will try to come up with a native advertising tactic that will get people to uh, be free, 
to reject this and have their consciences clear about it, that they don't have to be part of that 92%. We'll give you about a minute to come up with this. Wow. While we talk to the, yes, because you're so good at this stuff. <laughs> this is PR planning on the hoof. Okay, what, what we're going to do then, as soon as they come up with an idea, just, just to give the students a sense of what professionals might do with this, we're then going to ask the publisher, will she buy it? Now, you know what buying means? Buying it means, yes, she's going to get money. But now she has to say, as, as I think, what are my biases about this? Do I believe in vaccination? You're listening to me, Shannon? Do I believe in vaccination or do I believe in people's freedom? And then she might not take the placement based upon her own uh, prejudices. And then we're going to ask Charles here, as a consumer, when he sees these two tactics, which one persuades him more? And of course, he has to take into account his own position on it before he even sees the, excuse me, before he even sees the ad. Because we all look at ads with background. We all look at ads and, uh, with, with previous experience and what our wants and needs are. So we say, that's a good ad, yes, because it's going to benefit me. And then I'll drop in my little axiom so that we know to judge every piece of persuasion comes from benefit. No person ever does anything except for their own personal benefit. People fall on grenades for their benefit. They jump out of burning buildings for their benefit. They commit suicide for their benefit. So all of these people are going to be seeking some benefit to either side of this issue. Now, I have a good friend of mine that likes to debate me on this, but he always loses because there isn't anything you can think of that you don't do for your benefit. Even when you ask for forgiveness from something you might have done, you want happiness. You want freedom. So let's see what they come up with, these great message writers and, and tactics. OK, have you come up with something? You guys are finished already? Yeah. All right, are you guys finished? Or your time is up? Yeah. We, yeah. All right. <laughs> Carl, Kathleen, what are you going to propose to the publisher that would get people to be not so worried about being free? Well, but we, wait, our, our standpoint is against mandatory vaccinations, yes. right? Yes. Okay. They don't want them, they want to be free. Yes. We but they're be being free. told you should worry, right, you have, right. you're going to cause disease, you're a bad person okay. in society. Now, I, I generally tend to agree that, that, that people should be vaccinated. No, 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 but, you can't but, do that. But, but, okay. I just, just as a disclaimer, All right. if I were paid a couple million dollars uh, on the other side, what I would probably come <laughs> yeah. up with Take that is the idea that um, would hinge on uh, sort of a libertarian view, which I agree with in a way that parents would have the right, should have the right, to determine their children's medical course of treatment and not give them things that they don't believe that the children should have. So I would find someone well-credentialed who could articulate that point of view, perhaps a doctor, perhaps a lawyer, and uh, put and make that per have that person write essays and perhaps uh, include those his quotes into pieces and get he would be our mouthpiece. Uh, you, see, you see what he did? He's, he's predicating his solution on the fact that he's already done research, that his audience respects medical authority. That's where he goes. If that's not true, he loses. If it's true, he wins. What's yours? Our uh, approach is to go to the publisher and talk about how this isn't just something that's affecting children, although that's where the focus has been, but all you have to do is look at what's happened in the last two weeks in the National Hockey League. Mumps has come back to adults, very serious disease if you have it, you cause infertility for adults, plus the fact that the people rights to people's rights to, Don't look over there. He's to mocking the PR people. No, I just, I've had this pain, my God. The pain in here, I know. <laughs> you just got it, right? I hope it's a toothache. Go ahead. Uh, if okay. it's falling on the right side, it's mumps. <laughs> oh. Uh, but then we also, though, hammer home or make clear the point that, yes, people do have individual rights, but they stop at my front door. Okay. They stop at the door where you're and now putting my child. What's your placement look like? What's in it? That's where we were. Uh, we were, we were still, still alive. Uh, we're we're going to give back. the shot. Well, okay. <laughs> the greater uh, good for the, for, for the greatest number. Well, once yeah. they finish thinking about it, they will have already concluded that their <coughs> solution is predicated on societal guilt. Mm -hmm. 
and now they have to picture that or sell it. I China, which of these two? We could reach legislators where you could have states mandate. Okay, we're not interested in the issue. We're just interested. Oh, I'm in, sorry. We're only, we're only interested in <laughs> so your you technique. you finally agree with states' rights. Thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, which of these two appeals to you as a publisher? Beside the money. Um, having the, but it depends on if they can get a doctor or a lawyer. So they don't the have the picture yet. They have. Yes. They're missing the image and the, the real guts of the thing. If, okay. if they have that, then I'm so I would. I would purchase that, but without that credibility, I would definitely purchase it. Do you have a personal bias on this issue or not as a gatekeeper? Um, Better question. Okay. If you do, <laughs> would it influence your decision or would you just take the money? I think, um, I think it would be my responsibility not to let my own personal bias confront what, what's going on. Your responsibility? On. Yes. You think you can overcome that? <laughs> what do you think? Which one do you like to read about? Uh, I feel more comfortable with the credibility. Um, you know, if they have a, a credible doctor, lawyers, I, I would immediately be persuaded. So you like the authority concern. part of it? I do. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a personal bias in reading this coming into it? Just me personally, I feel more comfortable seeing something, no matter what it is, if there's a credible source. If it's, com if it's coming from a credible, credible source. source. You want to touch it and see it, right? I, yeah. I want you to don't touch just it. want the... the the National Institutes of Health, or don't don't uh, pinch my kid group. You don't want them telling you. That's the old style of advertising. Right. Okay, we come to the end of this segment, and now we're going to ask the audience yourselves if you have any questions. We have microphones there, Professor Fitzgerald, Professor Moore, or, or Professor Kim, and you can ask any question to anybody up here. They don't have to be in their role if they wish to now uh, come out of the closet and do whatever. <laughs> They want to do. <laughs> yes. Um, question. I have a question for anybody who'd want to answer. But as a senior going into the field, and I'm going to be faced with this PR dilemma: Is it ethical to do sponsor content? But my boss wants to. What do you suggest me to do? As a new PR employee, what do you suggest me to do if my boss is saying that they want sponsor content? But me personally, I don't believe in it. Do I go with what my boss has to do and just suck it up and do it? How or? big is your mortgage? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't have one yet, no. so. Right. How much? How much student debt are you graduating? Well, zero. One of, one of oh, the okay. PR people. One of the PR people want to take that. K Kathleen stole my line that was taught to me the first night in law school. It depends, um, but you know, I I think that there's a, realistically you have to look at it on a case by case situation because it goes to to me it would go to the ex to the extent that whether something is uh, really damaging and and if I'm and it, truly if I'm really going to put people at risk the issue we were talking about with with vaccination I believe truly that public's largely going to be put at risk if we're not prudent getting vaccinations I'd walk away because I wouldn't want that on my head now, if I'm selling somebody, yeah, it's different. That's yeah. life and death. That's why I gave you that case. Yeah, you know, exactly. Selling ice cream. I mean, if it, if it's ice cream and somebody's going to get right. get fat from that, that's your choice. Can I, you know? uh, Dave, I want to jump in here. Give you, Can you give you a little talk, bit. Okay. Talk ahead, to your boss as to why he or she thinks sponsored content has benefits. Get an idea of where they're coming from, um, and tell some of the stuff that you've learned. In, right. in, in college. One of the reasons he's hiring you is because you've had this training. So, uh, uh, but I, I would, I wouldn't just walk out because you don't agree no. with it. That would be a mistake. More find out why your boss likes it. There's more thinking to do. Because of your training, you learned an ethics class yeah. that your ethics is behavior, but your morals is your posture. And your morals are here. You don't want to do it, but he's asking you to do it. One of them is going to win. Sometimes you will readjust your moral, then the ethic just comes out. Mm -hmm. The ethic is easy. Once you put one higher than the other, you have to find out why one would go up and why one would go down. Question. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, in, in the middle there, Bo. Professor Kim. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, with the paid advertising for, uh, you called it the uh, native content, 
uh, the, the computer age made this possible, again, more possible as far as uh, that. Can the computer age solve it with a new pricing model, a new way to pay uh, content providers, say a consortium of uh, hard news newspapers come together and say we're going to charge a, a penny per read or something like that without the advertising? Is there a new way to pay for uh, content, uh, verifiable content? Is that is that a possibility in the future? If Amazon can get me something, you know, kind of, uh, to my home, can we do something hmm. to pay for it a different way? Right, news. Who do you, to whom do you want to address that? Uh, to anyone, that's fine. Carl? Maybe to miss yes. the, yeah, the, the, <clears throat> believe it or not, one of the things that's making a resurgence is paid subscriptions. New York Times in the last couple of years has lost money on digital advertising. Uh, uh, digital advertising uh, banner has gone like a rock. The um, sponsored content, I think, went down a little bit too. Its subscriptions went up. Unfortunately, we made a bad mistake, which we didn't know was a mistake at the time, where we started giving away things for free. And it's hard to get people uh, to buy things that were free at one time. But it's not impossible. I rest my case, you know? I mean, you can sell. This comes out of a tap. It says right on the back, purified tap water, basically. So uh, people are not always rational in what they buy. So I think that there probably are some avenues, including subscriptions, if we can convince people of the value of news. There are other types of uh, proposals, too, which are, are micro payments, where you might get a credit card that allows you to read a certain number of metered payments. The metered payment system has been working very well for the Wall Street Times, the Financial Times, where you get a certain amount for free and then you pay a little bit after that. It's all a matter of, of making the economic model work itself out. And it takes decades for economic models to work themselves out. It took decades for radio to make money. It took decades for classified advertising to develop in newspapers. So we're not at the end of the road yet. Uh, native advertising works right now. It's a stopgap measure. Maybe some of these other things will come back and maybe come back in force. We have time, Professor Chosny, for two more questions. That's a go. John, please, in the back, and we'll take you next. John? Oh, oh you want to take this one. We'll take you first, because you have the mic. John, okay. you'll be next. All right, my question is for Professor Basso. Um, taking the idea that Carl came up with earlier, um, if I work for Swiffer and I'm writing a native advertisement of 10 ways to clean your house using Swiffer products, you said that's not, that's not journalism. There's not really much value in that. Wouldn't you see the value in that if, you, if someone else had written it that didn't work for Swiffer and it was just like written from the perspective of like someone that's a professional maid that's just giving you tips? And if, if you read the Swiffer one and you just take out all the references to Swiffer products and just replace them with generic duster, Windex, or ammonia-based cleaner, is there not a value in that? Yes, but um, you know, I, I guess when when I was was giving you my ethical high horse, uh, <laughs> I'm talking about much larger issues because from my perspective, if if as a public relations person, I'm disseminating information that is um, about you know our product, as long as you know, if a journalist then chooses to run that as a story, that's that. That, that's that's a story. That's 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 acceptable, okay. Um, I don't really even have a big issue if it was if, if the ad if it was written by someone and it was identified as something that we paid for. That's not a that's not a big issue. So you know what what I would I really need to go get somebody who is a completely neutral person? No, because the average ordinary prudent person's going to be able to identify it as being an ad where it came from and they can make a rational choice and conceivably we are the expert in that area of you know cleaning a, a home the, the swiffer but you know when we get into larger issues that's where I, I think i really run it run into a problem and i think that gives us a heightened duty a heightened ethical duty that we need to protect publics and you make a bad I, purchase decision i'll get over that i would agree with you, you know. and thank you for answering my question you're welcome question goes to the idea of the target audience who's going to identify with the ad mm -hmm. whether it's cleaning ladies or cleaners in general right. and who's more credible 
Do you have a mic, John? Yeah, I think my question was pretty much in the, in the same vein. Uh, just uh, you know, get a little confused sometimes when we talk about PR and, and marketing and advertising, and we, we we kind of mess around with it. But the the native advertising is advertising. Uh, I don't see it as PR per se. But at the same time, we have a trend in PR where we have brand PR now, where organizations are hiring journalists to work for them, writing stories to post on their websites, on their Facebook page, um, as, you know, as, a, as a story. So I think the entire concept of public relations needs to be reviewed. To your point earlier, does I was going the to RSA you, need to take do, a look at it? You know, what, what's the direction we're moving in? Because mm -hmm. it's... Um, there's several different trends happening right now that are muddying what public relations is all about. Mm -hmm. To your earlier point, I agree with you that there's a difference, I think, between marketing PR and PR when we're dealing with issues that are of some urgency mm -hmm. or some importance or deal with life and death. Mm -hmm. But marketing a product, there's no way in heck I'm going to put out a news release that talks about the bad side of my product. But if I am in the middle of a controversy and I'm dealing with the media and the public and they're asking me what's going on, then I'm going to have to be honest about what's happening. So I think there's different levels of public relations, I guess is what I'm getting and at. And John, finally, since, since you're there as past president of the Philadelphia PRSA, somebody comes seeking admission to the society, spends 80% of their time in native advertising. Are they in or not? I think that they're in. If they're declaring it as public, if they're declaring themselves as public relations people, I think they're in. So it's going to be self-defining. But is now? Well, not when. Well, when we tried to gain admission, we had to prove we didn't do advertising. We had to prove we were doing PR as it was defined then. As it was defined then, but it's becoming very much less clear where the line would be drawn. If you're writing content and that content is published. But it's paid. what's the difference between that and a public relations person whose job a few years ago was writing content for trade publications and you paid for the placements? And they didn't appear with any disclaimer. They ran in the trade publication as an article. You paid for it. Maybe nobody wagged their finger at them at that yeah. time. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you, audience. Let's give them a great hand. They did a good job. Good job. Thank you, Sam. Suzanne Please join us in room 108 for some refreshments and thanks for coming. Thanks, Tony. Great job. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs>